Welcome to Behind the Scenes Virtual Edition. Today I will demonstrate traditional gesso making, pigment grinding and my way of working with the egg tempera paint. I was trained in traditional gilding techniques in a three-year apprenticeship in Switzerland and I learned to create new picture frames and I was also taught to restore the old. Later at the Art School of Zurich, I was first exposed to tempera paint and adding the, the egg yolk to the, I'm um, going to stop it for a moment, the egg yolk to the store-bought um, paints. And so that was a type of uh, egg tempera painting, which was very fascinating and useful. And uh, basically, at the jump in in time, here is the image of Giotto uh, looking at this beautiful work. Um, basically, this is where all my techniques originate. Um, in this video, I will show you how I prepared a gesso similar to what would have been made in Giotto's workshop. Uh, image of the back of the same painting. It's always interesting to see the back and actually an earlier version pre-restoration of the same panel. All right, so here we go. This is uh, how I prepared the gesso. You see rabbit skin glue, uh, both in sheet form and in granular version that has to be soaked. Here I am using the granular version because it is uh, faster. Uh, and that's really the only reason. If I made, I would make a huge quantity, I probably would use the sheets and it would soak them overnight. But here it's just really practical to use uh, the granular version and it, it soaks up immediately. It takes about an hour till it becomes, gets this stage where it's thicker. You can see it's thicker and I keep on mixing it. Every time I pass it, I mix it a little bit and I keep on walking off and do the next thing. Here I have a hot pot of water and I place the uh, rapid, skin glue, rapid skin glue that's soaked inside. Um, and with uh, the heat, um, it becomes liquid. So this is step number one of gesso making. This is the base uh, of it all. I add a little bit more hot water to make it thinner um, and divide it into pots for just for practical reasons. Now for making the gesso, I need chalk and I use um, the chalk of Bologna. That um, works well for me. There is, uh, every artist probably would use a different one. Uh, this one, you could use a mixture. Uh, this one is kind of, um, it's almost creamy. It's thick. It's, uh, it feels uh, very thick and you uh, see, I press it through the um, strainer here to make it as smooth as possible so that there's no uneven messes inside. Um, it clumps up. Uh, when it's uh, in, in, this is like a five kilo bag of chalk and it clumps up in there. And so I put it through the strainer to make sure that uh, when it gets into the glue, into the warm glue, um, that it gets uh, soaked up all the way. It's a slow process. You add more and you add more and you add more till it becomes a certain consistency. And then you take uh, a brush and start stirring it. Now the stirring is very important. You don't want to upset the mixture. You want to be gentle. You can work fast, but you don't want to uh, mix it too harshly. Um, and you just want to mix it all the way. And actually what happens here, and I don't think I have an image of it, I strain it one more time to make sure that there's no uneven messes. And then um, I let it rest. You can let it rest for a couple hours or overnight. And as it cools off, there's like a skin building up on top that you can take off the skin and basically throw it out. You don't want that. The bubbles from within the gesso form and they come to the top surface and they, um, you, you want to get rid of those bubbles because if there's bubbles in the gesso, you're going to transfer them onto your surface and it, 
it's very ugly actually and it's hard to repair so you want to make sure that there's no bubbles um, to avoid that if they form for whatever reason if they form you can add some a cream or you can add a little oil just tiny amount and that might help now here I'm uh, again this is the way I work so this is not uh, necessary traditional I prepare my canvases um, and Giotto would have used panels um, I like uh, for different reasons I like the canvases although on some level they are totally impractical because uh, they cannot be rolled up so what I have to do uh, in order to make sure that they don't crack I nail them here onto uh, wooden boards in preparation for adding the gesso. Um, I don't use stretchers. I like the form of the canvases. Each canvas has its own form. Sometimes they're stretched in weird ways and they're out of shape. Um, this is pretty regular, more or less a square. And I don't pull too hard when I stretch it because basically once the wet gesso goes on it, it will stretch itself. Um, so here, here you see that I, I started in the center on all four sides and I worked slowly towards the edges. Adding the gesso itself, now the gesso is warm. It can't be boiling hot, otherwise it gets to be bubbly and it can't be cold because otherwise it's no longer liquid. And I make sure everything is in order and I apply a fairly large amount in the center of the canvas to my surface and then uh, distribute it towards the outside. The big drawback with the nails there that they get in the way with the brush. So I have to be careful if I get caught with the brush on the nails, I might uh, pull out the hair of the brush, which is, I don't want to do that because brushes are expensive. So I have to be careful. I also don't want to leave any puddles. So I have to be work carefully around these nails. Um, and there was like a little uh, fuss ball there. So I had to remove that. And I have to work fast because as soon as the gesso hits the, the canvas, it cools down. And again, when it's cool, it will, it's no longer liquid. It will solidify. And when I go over it with a brush, then it will tear open. It gets, it gets ugly. So you have to work fast. Now for the canvas, for my purpose, I only apply one coat of gesso. If I worked on panels, I might apply as many as nine coats and sand in between. I probably would apply them wet on wet, which means I let it dry just the right amount. And then while it's still sort of halfway wet, I would apply the next layer. So now I wanna make sure I don't leave any spots out. I don't leave any lakes. Just do the final uh, checking uh, that there's no uh, ungessoed canvas and that's that's it this little piece of canvas uh, has been gessoed and now it has to dry the drying time depends on um, the weather uh, and you know generally speaking the next day for sure it will be dry now you see this is very uneven very rough not at all what uh, Giotto would have liked for my purpose that's what I I really like. This has been sanded down a little bit. This is an old example. These are newer ones where it's rough. And you see the edges of the canvas that I play with. Basically, how do I choose my colors and pigments? I have three very simple criteria. One, do I like it? And does it fit into my limited palette? Two, is it permanent and light fast? And three, how toxic is it? I try to only use non-toxic pigments. So here uh, you see uh, titanium white and I've read up on it and basically they're using it for sunscreen lotion and food uh, coloring. So I figured this is gonna be the least toxic uh, pigment possibly. Um, here basically the process repeats itself, so I will explain better what I'm doing. Um, 
the pigment gets placed on this crystal or glass palette mixed with water and a palette knife first and then ground with the glass smaller. Once ground, they are placed in a sealed container and stored in a cool and dry place. Here's the yellow ochre. It's a clay earth pigment, all natural. Um, as a general rule, the earth pigments are easy to use. The water gets absorbed immediately and beautifully. They are all, it's, it's almost creamy in texture. So here you see me working with a palette knife. So basically, I will work with large quantities. I, uh, I just prepare small amounts. Um, and then after I grind them, I put them into small containers, sealed containers, and uh, use them up uh, bit by bit. Um, and as soon as I finish them up, I, I grind some more. One, one really important practical tip is when you find a color that you like, it is a great idea to purchase larger, a larger quantity because um, you never know when the art supply stores will no longer carry it or the manufacturer uh, discontinue the pigment. And it can leave a big gaping hole on your palette and make it really difficult because you kind of get attached to those colors. You learn to work with them. And then in the end, if you don't have that, then you have to yeah, maybe start from scratch. But it's, uh, it has happened to me on more than one occasion. And so when I really get attached to a color, I make sure I have plenty of that. You have to have just the right amount of water. If there's not enough water on it, then it gets sticky and your, your molar gets stuck on the surface. If it's too much, then the pigment is too uh, liquid, well, too thin, really. Um, this is an interesting one. Uh, it's very bright red and it's actually a root. Uh, in German, it's called Krapplack um, and uh, English alterine matter, I guess. And you see how the pigment escapes. It does not want to be mixed. And it needs actually lots of droplets of um, alcohol to be convinced to be mixing with the water into a paste. See, it's, it's, all, it's all dry still. I need to add more of the alcohol. And now it slowly adds up. Uh, into a paste. Do you see how the color changes um, when it becomes a liquid? And that's something that you have to take into consideration when you, like now it changes and it will change again when you apply it to the surface. As it dries, the, the pigment, the color will change again. Something you get used to, your mind automatically will adjust and take that into consideration. Persian blue is one of my absolute favorite colors. Uh, has no problems absorbing the water. Uh, oh, one thing that uh, I find important um, is you can actually purchase the ground pigments at the art supply store. So you don't necessarily have to do this work, especially let's say you work from your kitchen and you're concerned about the, the health and safety and the toxicity of all these things. Um, they, they, you know, they, they go up into the air and you find them in the weirdest places afterwards, like traces of the pigment. So it's, uh, good to work with a mask. Probably ideally you would even work with gloves. If you get them all over your hands, it's probably not the best idea. Um, then of course we have the ultramarine blue, which is considered the most precious and beautiful color ever. Look how the pigment escapes upwards. I don't know if you saw that, but it just escaped upwards into the air. And I was not shaking it or upsetting it. It just was automatic. It, the water hit the pigment and it escaped through the air. Uh, Ultramarine was formerly made by crushing lapis lazuli, uh, bright, blue rock consisting largely of lazuli. 
So here you see me just work with the palette knife and I don't think I have an image of the glass smaller, but basically this is the, the process. It repeats itself. And then I put them into these little uh, containers. Uh, note there is no glue here. The glue gets added later. So what you see here is just the mixing and grinding of the pigments. Uh, and in any paint form, you need glue. Without the glue, the paint will not stick to the surface. Okay. Again, in every paint, you need a glue. And in egg tempera, the glue is the egg yolk. It needs to be separated out, similar to what you would do in preparing a cake, with one difference. The sac that encloses the egg, egg yolk has to be removed. Um, as you can see, I do this undelicately with my fingers and then throw it out, or I may give it to my cats to eat, which they like. The brushes, I uh, will talk about them later. And here you see me adding the egg yolk. Oh, uh, you see me adding the egg, egg yolk to the different colors. I have a plastic palette and I make sure there's uh, lots of uh, liquid. Uh, covering basically the pigments. Right now I am mixing a very light color because I want to generally want to work from light to dark. And what I start out doing, I do a drawing. This is not, I don't consider this painting. This is basically a drawing with a paintbrush and the light color. And I have, I, I sort of get my, I take my measurements of what I want to do. Now I should say a couple of things about this particular painting here. As you can see, I work on paper, so this is not on the canvas that I promised you. Uh, this is uh, because I'm experimenting actually, and I do not want to use a uh, time consuming or expensive canvas for an experiment. Uh, I actually work from observation here. You cannot see what I'm looking at. I have a model, a life model on the computer screen. And this is the time of social distancing um, has brought us together in different ways. And this for me is one of them. As many of you know, I have started this drawing project of 40 quarantine portraits during the time of COVID, where my subjects, uh, friends, family, acquaintances, and some people that came to me through word of mouth, they sit for me for three hours, and in exchange, I have sewn two masks per portrait that I sent to my sitters. Now, this painting here is not part of the project. Um, as the person on the other side is a professional model, she, uh, um, I used the time with her to basically do a research to work on my other drawings. Um, I did not want to repeat the same drawing with different people for 40 times. I wanted to keep growing with it. And so I was experimenting with different materials. And this was one of the times I did this. Um, so everything is a bit strange and unusual uh, because because of the times we live in, in, but I believe that it shows my painting process well. So what I'm doing here is blocking out the space. I have moved from the drawing into slowly uh, painting, and I'm still a little bit getting my berries. There's still a lot of very white spaces on the uh, surface. Um, and I mix the colors. This is one of the particularities of um, egg tempera or temper in general. Uh, the colors get mixed solely on the palette. I can mix my paints directly on the painting. Uh, I cannot, sorry, <laughs> I'm mixing it up. I cannot mix my paints directly on the painting as I could if I was using different media such as oil, for example. I cannot push the paint around on my paper. It stays wherever I make it land. The mixing has to be exclusively done on the palette. It is a way of working that one has to get used to. However, it is not difficult. 
um, the more you do it, it's like with everything else, the more you do it, the better you get at it. So it's, it's not, it's really, it's not difficult. Um, the yolk has to be prepared fresh every day. Um, and whatever pigments have been mixed in with the yolk must be used up on that same day. Uh, some people like to cover the palate in cellophane and refrigerate it overnight. I personally find that the pigments treated like that become gritty. Uh, again, uh, it probably should be ground one more time. Um, I also do not like working with cold paint. I find the material is harder to apply and I question the longevity of it if it's applied, uh, if it's too cold when it's applied to the surface. So it might just come off easier. Um, let's see. I always work from observation. Um, but normally not over the computer. I usually stand up while I work. Uh, here you see me seated. I normally work with natural daylight. And here it is actually past midnight as this particular model was posing for the open drawing at the New York Academy of Art where I had gotten uh, my MFA years ago at the Graduate School of Figurative Art. And as an alumna, I get to participate in the open drawing which is great now over Zoom, I can reconnect with my old friends from the academy days. So this is a side note. Um, the brushes, the, depending on the size of my canvas, I use smaller or larger brushes. So this is a small, small uh, surface, so I use small brushes. It, they are large for egg tempera painting. But for me, they are small. Um, they are made from ox hair. They are soft, flat, thus enabling me to work with the wide or with the narrow side. Um, I use several of the same size brushes at the same time in order to keep one just for the yellows, one for the reds, one for the blues. Uh, and I make sure that they don't mix together. I mean, slowly they do mix together and then I wash them out and I start from afresh. But generally speaking, I work with probably like, I, I like it best with like four different brushes that I keep separate. And actually, if you uh, notice, I do often like I look for the same color all over the canvas. So I go by little adding little dots here and there. The the just little marks putting it together. Um, I don't finish the nose, but I do like a little blue of the nose, and the and then I go to the next blue spot on the shirt or on the side of the cheek. Um, so, of course, the water has to be kept clean. The brushes have to be kept clean, so that the paint does not get mushy. Tempera dries almost immediately to the touch, which means that I cannot, actually I cannot work over it if it's wet underneath. I have to wait till it's dry, but it's so fast the process that it's not even a real concern. I, I just have to know it. If somewhere it's wet, I wait and I don't go over it there. I work in different areas all at once. Uh, it could potentially, the color could potentially be scraped down. If I make a major error, error especially with a dark color, I, um, I, I could scrape it down. I could remove it even with water, uh, with a hard brush. I can just basically erase what I did. Um, Egg tempera is not to be confused with the contemporary tempera paint, also sometimes called poster paint, which is a mixture of pigments with glue sizing. It is matte, whereas egg tempera is uh, a little bit glossy. Traditional egg tempera is a mixture of pigments, as you have seen with egg yolk, 
that forms a permanent fast drying surface. Now, I want to say that I do use some poster paints. It is really useful alternative. When I run out of a pigment mid-session, it is wonderful to just turn to a tube. And what I do is I use that still with the egg. I enhance it with the egg yolk, which allows me to layer it. Uh, just the tempera, I could not layer it or it will get uh, all muddy in color. But with the egg, I can layer it and apply many layers on top of one another, make it transparent and the bottom layers can shine through. Uh, when I use the poster paints, I make sure that the, uh, the light fastness is excellent and that uh, they have proven themselves permanent. So traditionally, egg yolk is mixed with water, as you have seen here, but it can be used with oil or even with wax. The medium is very versatile, more so than oils, where oil saturated layers must be laid over the lean to ensure that the stability of the bond. In, so that like you start out with lean and then you get, it gets more and more greasy up on top. In the case of the tempera, even if the reverse reaches an or uh, with the reverse, it can reach an archival state. So I can go back and forward with more egg yolk or less, and it, it's perfectly fine. It's really uh, a forgiving material. The way that the temper flows from the brush has been likened to drawing with a soft pencil. The drying speed and mixing requirements impose a discipline on the painter, but this is not necessarily a disadvantage once prepared. The painting strokes are applied in thin translucent layers, uh, more or less. You can decide how much trans, uh, translucency you want or films to a fairly sturdy um, Surface such as wood again traditionally, but like here paper or what I do canvas I have to underline here that when I do use canvas. I have uh, The canvas backed up by a wooden board and when the board is removed then I sew my canvases on thick museum quality cardboard the canvas uh, prepared with rapid skin glue just so cannot be rolled up or if anything like in a really large roll but in a tiny little roll it would just crack and thus be damaged or destroyed um i use a limited palette and you can see here now i'm changing the color of the shirt actually the model was wearing a black shirt and Maybe I've noticed I do not have black on my palette. Um, I want to achieve the darks by mixing the colors together. So I'm limiting myself and I sometimes have to make a translation because I cannot get it realistic. Uh, for a black shirt, probably a black will come in handy, but I don't, I don't want that for my, um, for my palette. I'm, Intrigued by the fact that the black is missing, the black color is missing. Um, one fun fact as I was reading uh, about the different egg temper paintings, uh, I, I use organic uh, chicken eggs from free roaming chickens, though apparently Russian icon painters prefer goose eggs because of their higher oil content. The paint is then applied in very thin layers to the gesso panel. Eventually, many layers of transparent paint are applied, working up into highlights and down into shadows. So it's the layering that gives this tempera a unique quality, and if done carefully, optical effects can be worked out that can't, can't be obtained by any other medium. No lacquering or finishing is required. So when I get up from this, I can just leave it as is. I don't have to put a lacquer over it. 
uh, over the course of several years, the surface will harden and become more durable than any oil-based varnish. As you watch me paint, I want to mention a little bit about history. Um, egg tempera painting has a long and rich history um, because of its dura durability and its simplicity in the making. It is favored in the ancient world and examples still exist from Egypt, Greece, Rome, and India dating back more than 2000 years. Up until the middle of the Renaissance, the ma majority of paintings on wooden panels were done in egg tempera. Perhaps the most famous example might be Botticelli's Birth of Venus. During the medieval period in Europe, it was the dominant form of painting up until the advent of oil paint in the 1500s. Even as oil paint began to take over, temper was still used in the underpainting, not least because of its fast drying time. It was um, the popularity of canvas supports that eventually phased out the tempera, which again requires a rigid surface. And just think of the possibility of transportation, a large heavy wooden panel that's like put together with lots of different panels is extremely fragile and difficult to transport heavy um, in and out of a workshop where as a canvas can be removed from the stretchers, rolled up and mounted back on the stretchers very easily. In Byzantine and Romanesque art, tempera paintings and gold leaf characterized both manuscripts and panels. Gilding was applied first due to technical limitations and painted around the gilded areas afterwards. Examples are the paintings of Frangelico and in the early works of uh, Piero della Francesca. However, with the rise of naturalism, the use of gold leaf fell away. It is actually really difficult to make a panel with both gold and paintwork visually, as I have discovered in my own work and as I was teaching some workshops. Generally speaking, the gold has to be applied always on the background. Uh, the gold leaf is flat and shiny, depending on the angle, it can appear dark and even uh, almost black, where the, the paint has a completely different texture and visual attraction. Um, pure egg temper method came from the studio of Giotto, and I believe it can be assumed that it was at its height side by side with true fresco in the 13th and 14th centuries. The transition to oil paint introduced to Italy and elsewhere from the Netherlands during the latter part of the 15th century was itself partly a modification of tempera. Developed through the addition of oil to mixture of egg, both Van Eyck up in the north and in Italy, Antonello de Messina pioneered the process. Um, oil mixtures on an oil ground of the type thought of as oil painting were not standard practice until the days of Franz Hals and Rembrandt in the 1700s. The practice of temper then was replaced by oil, but only partially, and even in the 18th century, large-scale temper works such as Rossi's ceiling in the Villa Borghese in Rome were undertaken. Thus, tempera remained somewhat popular. There are examples again in the 19th century from Switzerland, Böcklin, France, Moreau, and Austria, Klimt, Although egg tempera uh, never fully regained its former stature throughout the centuries, artists have frequently rediscovered the special qualities that make tempera painting a unique art form. A couple of examples of 20th century, 
20, 20th century contemporary painters include Ben Sean and Andrew Wyatt. So this is uh, basically what I've prepared and there is seven eight minutes in the video so I can uh, fast forward it just a little bit so that you get to see where this goes. Um, again, for me this has been a experiment. Um, as I, it was very late actually this 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 uh, drawing sessions at the New York Academy of Art for me in in Italy they work from midnight till 3 a.m. so I get a little bit tired I would say and I don't always hold up till 3 a.m. but it was uh, it's it's just a fun uh, thing to participate in and and so I, I really try to to be there when when they offer it um, and sometimes I draw and sometimes I paint. And this was a, a one time I, I painted. Uh, let's see, this is almost done. And I'm gonna open up the floor to questions. I'm just gonna forward it a little more. So it's just the last few, the last minute or so. Um, I noticed like in the very end that I had left out some like the space right there next to the eye I left out blank. I had not applied color. I generally try to cover the whole page or the whole canvas early on and For some reason I had not realized that that was uh, without paint And this is my palette. It's no longer that clean. It's the, the white, you can see the, where the white was. It's now all yellow. This, if I kept on painting, I would have to clean that in order to keep my colors uh, clean. Otherwise, it's so easy to get mushy. So I have to be really careful with that. And sometimes when it has to go fast, I just grab some white with my brush and it gets, it gets uh, contaminated. Um, but I try not to do that. So this, this is the end and a couple of other paintings that I've worked on but way longer, just to give you, for those of you who don't know my work, uh, to give you a better sense uh, of some of the works I have done in the past. And this is it. So stop share. And it's good to see your faces and um, I, I welcome you to ask some questions. So if you have a question, you have to unmute yourself to, so that I can hear you. Suzanne, this is wonderful and your paintings are beautiful. Um, this is a practical question. I was just curious about the palette. Is it difficult to clean while you're working? Because of no. the egg yolk. I was no, it's maybe. not. Yeah, the egg yolk is a little greasy, but it's not that greasy. I just, uh, yeah, Second when color. I fit, yeah, no, just with the brush, with a little bit of water. So when I finish uh, at the end of the day and I finish and I clean my palette, first I take like a paper towel and uh, if there's, I generally don't have much paint left, but if there was like a little bit of a bulb of paint left, I would not throw it down the water drain, but I would throw it into the trash. And then um, I wash it out with water. The brush, that's really important. The brush, I wash out with water and soap. But the palette just with, with, uh, with water. Very thorough demonstration. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a question. It's very nice, Suzanne. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Um, um, I was thinking that, so if you use a tempera to paint something a little bit more dramatic, for example, like a Baroque style painting, would you still be going from light to dark? Or in this case, you'll probably be going from dark to light or somewhere in the middle. I would definitely go from light to dark with, for the one reason, um, and that, that's, that's fairly important. Um, if you start with the dark right away, 
then you might encounter the problem that when you go over with light, it will not be as light. It won't ever be as light if there's dark underneath. So even when I start with like a, a little bit of a yellow, I will never get back to the whitest white. Okay. So I want to always start working from the light and go to the, towards the dark. But if I make a mistake, I can wash it off or I can scrape it off. There's, it, again, it's very forgiving. But generally, I want to be very careful with putting down the darks. Like you saw in the painting, like I had in the beginning, like the eyes, I just put big ball blobs of, of like brush strokes of the eyes, which was kind of uh, um, maybe a bit too courageous. Uh, but I was able to, to go back over it and, and remove just those round blobs. And so it's to some extent it's possible, but with, with caution. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Suzanne, it's Jane. Hi, Jane. Um, hi, that was great, thank you. That was really fascinating. Um, my question also kind of relates to what Jenny just said. Um, in, and you kind of said that you tend to not leave anything completely white, but on this drawing that you just did, it did seem like there were white highlights. Do you ever leave those things just, um, you know, because you can't get white again. You, you never have white, I guess, as a pigment that you work with, just like you yeah, don't have black. I, I do have the white pigment. So I, uh, it's just slightly darker than the page, I guess. Um, I, I generally really try to cover the whole page, the whole surface. And if I did leave out some, then it's, it's not one. It just has a different texture. Uh, and, okay. and so, it can, I guess it can happen, but especially when you work on canvas, it sticks out. When you do leave, it's like okay. a hole, like leaving a hole. And of course, other artists work differently and they leave out some, uh, some canvas on purpose. You can play with that, I guess. Uh, it's mm -hmm. just my way. Generally, I like to cover it all. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Suzanne, this is Pat. Hi, Pat. Hi, how are you? Good, that was, how are you? That was wonderful. Um, I have a question about your use of color. You have this wonderful grasp, I think, on color. And like in the portrait you just did, you weren't obviously necessarily using realistic colors to right. get a realist. So you have to have, I think, a real understanding of color theory and how to substitute colors and tones. What, what kinds of things would you suggest to someone who wants to be able to have a better understanding of color and its use? Are there exercises you would suggest? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, you could do some really boring exercises like, <laughs> I consider boring. Color wheel. Like take one, yeah, yeah the color wheel or, or take one, actually you could take like even a tube of paint and, and like a tempera paint and just add uh, like use it pure and then add a little bit of white and then a little more and a little more do like a step and you could do it in the other direction too but you could mix it with any other color just add more and more and more or you could use it with black I would start out with white uh, with that it depends on your character I mean some for some people that's such a boring exercise and you would not give pleasure and they would never do that and I um, what I do, there. you are right, those colors are not at all realistic. I like to use, um, like transit, like I'm not using black, I'm not using many colors on my palette. I like to use, like almost do a translation, like in language. Uh, and uh, I decide, uh, did this, uh, what I see here, black or blue, now this is a different color. For, so for, for this, I'm limiting myself and changing it to what I want it to look like. So it's it's a game in my head that I I do. Uh, you know, you can then agree and say, well, no, I or not agree, of course. Um, but I I like to transform it into something else. I like I like that comparison of it as a translation. I think that works well. I think that that helps understand it better. Thank you. Well, thank you. Yes, Jane, I think you're muted. So what would you say is your main attraction? I mean, I love it. I was wondering, it, it seems like it dries very quickly, so you have to work on top of, you can't do any blending. 
and there's a lot of clarity to the color. Um, right. Is that what you're most attracted to, the, right. the immediacy of the color? Yeah, I definitely want that. Yeah, I, I get lost. I have done some oil paintings, and I, I it's just not my, it's not my uh, sort of thing. It's like I never became friends with the oil paint, in part because of the smell, and I work from home, but in part also because I just never got the gist of it with the mixing where you could uh, keep on blending on, on your surface. It's for me, it's, it's just something that doesn't work. And I know some people do uh, an amazing job at it. I can only admire that. And it's just, I never, I never got to be friends with oil paint. And I, I really dislike acrylics. Um, I never mastered acryls, <laughs> so I have a lot of limitations, and I became these big friends with this egg temper. I just love it. I love the way it's just forgiving. It's like if I make a mistake, I can go over it. I can change it. If I can just add a little bit of the egg yolk, if I add too much, no big deal. If I add too little, then I can add more. I can uh, go back and forth. If I if I run out of a color that I don't have in the grinding and then I use uh, that from the tube and they work just as well. I have paintings that I've done over 30 years ago and they are just like they were then. And so, you know, I don't know what, what will happen in 200 years. Um, I, I don't know how much of a concern it is right now. I try to work with uh, materials that will be stable and I use, like I said, museum, museum board and I use, you know, sometimes costly materials to make sure that uh, when I sell something to somebody that I don't have to worry what will happen if they expose it to sunlight. N none of my paintings have changed in the sunlight uh, over the last 25, 30 them, years. I'm sorry, have any of them no. ever cracked um, from too much layering or that's never an issue because the layers are so thin? Oh, uh, no, they have not cracked. There is, uh, I, I, yeah, no, they have not really changed. I keep my egg temper paintings behind glass unless they're really big. And we have done uh, some experiments. I have a couple of huge paintings that are not behind glass and they are in somebody's living room. And uh, they have, uh, you know, they, they, they know they can't go with a sponge and rub it down. They know that. Um, and it's, uh, so far, it's been a success. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Again, I don't know what will happen uh, in long times. But for now, I must say it's something that works, gives me pleasure. And I feel it's, yeah, it's the way for me to work. Suzanne, can I ask something? Sure, Susan. Go Thank ahead. you. Those are so beautiful. Um, every time I look at your work, I see new color and new depth, and um, it's really, really nice. Um, I'm just curious about the um, matte versus shine, and I'm sorry if you answered this already, but I'm just curious if, like, did you say that you put a coat at the end to even it out, or? Um, you, you could, actually. I have done that. Um, to, to if to, I feel like it's like sort of blotchy mm -hmm. I have applied but you have to be careful because if I rub too much then I make the paint mushy so okay. then it starts mixing up so um it's just a quick thin layer and you can mm -hmm. pull it together beautifully um but it's not necessary uh it, it's when you apply the egg um let's say glue evenly within your pigment it's not necessary because it will blend on its own so uh the mat um yeah i mean the store-bought tempera paints are matte that they they have of course you could buy egg tempera paint also in the store and they are shinier uh but when you use the egg yolk it makes it shiny okay thank you Sure. Other questions? Hey, Susan Carmen from Madrid. Um, it was wonderful. Thank you very much for this uh, masterclass of, um, uh, of your paintings. It's been wonderful. I have a question that you probably have answered already, but I can, I can recall. Um, uh, 
it's a very simple. Do, the, you can use the yolk um, from the eggs at uh, any specific temper temperature. I'm thinking of uh, if I take the, the eggs out of the fridge and they're cold, or they need to be just at the, the room temperature or any specific, a specific temperature. I think that's a good question, actually. I, I find when I take the egg out of the refrigerator and I separate it and I add a little bit of water, just a few droplets of temp, uh, water that is room temperature, that's like the perfect mix. I don't want to add uh, hot water. I don't want to have it too cold. So just water from the room temperature, that's perfect. My, my concern is more like when I, if I put the, if I don't use it right away and I put the egg in the fridge, I have to sort of hide it from the cats because they love it. Uh, and so uh, at the idea is to, well, you know, it's summer, it's hot, I put it in the fridge, but then when I take it out, I don't like the consistency. I don't know what happens if there's a chemical reaction or what, I have no idea, obviously, I'm not a scientist. I don't know what I'm doing in that respect, but I don't like it. So I like when, once I have prepared the egg, I like to just keep it outside and use it that day. And obviously I don't leave it in the sun. I, I you know, I, I don't want to fry any eggs here on a hot Florentine day, but um, just in the shed. Oh, that's another thing. When you paint in direct sunlight, it dries very quickly. It gets to be a little bit annoying to work because it dries too quickly. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Any other questions? Well, I appreciate you came today on this uh, Saturday evening. Most of us are no longer in lockdown. I don't know uh, uh, for everybody, but I know you could do other things. So I appreciate you came today to listen to this talk. And uh, maybe you want to do some painting uh, with the mm -hmm. egg. And if you have questions, you can uh, always ask me later, you know, where to find me. Thank you, Suzanne. So Thank inspiring. You. Thank you. Thank Suzanne. you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you. Bye bye.